Nancy, thank you for joining me today. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, um, uh, uh, it's good to join you. Um, it's you. cold and sunny outside, but very cold. So I'm glad to be inside. Oh, good, good. Yeah, it's one of those late um, or just the afternoon on on a, I guess, an early winter kind of thing where the, the rays yeah. of the sun are long. And yeah, it's when I tend to take so many pictures of my cats that are outside because the light is. So I was just going to say my cats are near me and they're all they're laying in sunbeams stretched out waiting for me to, to go play with them. And yeah, um, yes, reward them for the tricks that you teach them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. um, um, yeah. So, so yeah, so, so my inspiration for beginning this podcast series uh, uh, that discusses just avoiding or escaping tunnel vision is because yeah. I think that the way veterinary medicine and human medicine too, but they've been so packaged and um, kind of protocolized that and, and sped up because of the either the corporatized thing or just the, the crush of time being limited, that there's a rush to diagnosis, a rush to treatment, and then sure. I feel like the animals and the patients get not the best care. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, what inspired me to start this was just my frustration with veterinarian's consideration of how do I treat an anorexia or inappetence in whatever a cat or a dog we're mainly small animal practitioners in the veterinary side so um and to me so you correct me if I'm wrong in your opinion but as whether it's so a graduate of, the, of an acupuncture program whether ours or someone else like you have an animal that's not eating and so they might say, what acupuncture points would be good? That makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. um, or not because of acupuncture, but because from, from the time you get from animal to ac like, <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about today is the stuff in between. Like, what does that animal need? Um, or if it's a drug, oh, I use this drug as an appetite stimulant. Right. So much is lost. So do you share that perception that there's too much of a rush to some kind of a treatment without fully understanding what the cause is. We, um, we, I, I work and co-own Left Hand Animal Hospital. It's an adorable practice in Niwot, Colorado. Um, we do have vet students that come through um, as part of their rotation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be seeing one in a couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. And we uh, do mentor our doctors as they join our team and mentor our nurses. Um, we empower our nurses to help us um, uh, with uh, diagnosis because they're honestly the, the ones that are working with the animals, right? I'm I'm working with the pet parent and the nurses are working with the animals and whatever they're seeing um, uh, helps us a whole lot to figure out a whole story. Um, when I talk with pet parents, I talk about, hey, look, I'm going to give you a story. The story might be a lie. And if it's a lie, that's OK, because then I go back and repeat the story in a different way. And that's the way I think of um, of trying to figure out what's going on with the animal is what's the story? Um, what's the history? Um, what am I seeing? What could that mean? Um, where are all the little paths that that could take me? Uh, and um and then figuring it all out. I love veterinary medicine for lots of reasons. And one of those reasons is that it's detective work and it's fun. Um, and right. every day it's a, a fun new thing to do. Um, and so not having tunnel vision makes it more fun. Right, right. And so when you see vet students, when vet students come into your practice to learn or you have new veterinarians, mm -hmm. I mean, is that kind of, intellectual curiosity that, oh, look, here's a puzzle. Is that something they've been brought up and cultivated to take on that way? Or 
Great question. Not. Um, uh, when I talk with veterinarians, they were all taught differential diagnosis, right? We were all taught DDXs, right? Um, having said that, many of us lose that because um, we feel like it takes a whole lot more time to sort things out. And so we get stuck in what I call cookbooking, where you say, hey, look, um, uh, what would be the drug for this or the acupuncture point for that or something like that. And um, uh, I, I gently remind folks, go back to the story. The story is not a cookbook. Right. A cookbook is a, a direction manual. Um, and what we're doing is compiling a story. Right. And so when you say, if you're telling a lie, I mean, that's your maybe presumptive diagnosis and you're recognizing that it could be wrong. Absolutely. And yeah, you might need it. to switch gears. Uh, that's right. So if the story, if I tell a story and the story is a lie, it means that I went so far with my differential diagnosis. My differential diagnosis was qualified as incorrect. And so I go back to the beginning of the story and tell the story again and come up with a different, um, a different path. So what, um, what would be that time that you'd say, oh, I must have been incorrect in my putative diagnosis? The animal, the animal tells me the incorrect path, or sometimes the pet parent tells me, uh-uh, can't be that. Um, we've all, as veterinarians, had the, oh, the animal that comes in that's not eating well, and it's a one-year-old Labrador retriever, and every veterinarian, uh, we tend to jump to, what did you eat? Um, mm -hmm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and if the pet parent clearly tells me, uh, 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 um, it, my, my one year old Labrador didn't eat that, mm -hmm. I still then come back to, OK, we'll just put that as one of the stories, but maybe it's not my initial story. And then we go through and the animal tells you whether you've got the story right. Right. Um, so if you um, pick a path and the path works and uh, the animal gets better, then uh, your story is true. And if you pick a path and the animal didn't get better, um, then recognizing it and going back to the beginning of the story and starting the story over again, um, rather than pursuing the path where you say, hey, they must get better. They must get better. Um, go back to the beginning, start the story over again and see where that path takes you. Right, right. Yeah, I love that flexibility and that continued connection with the client and the animal. Mm -hmm. And how do your hands, how does your physical exam sway you one way or the other? Absolutely. My physical exam, um, my, phys my physical exam and my palpation exam um, and my history and any other things I have, uh, blood works, ultrasounds, urinalyses, x-rays, whatever, they're all pieces of a puzzle. Um, and those pieces of a puzzle help me literally create a picture. Um, and that's also how I explain it to pet parents is I have pieces of a puzzle and putting the puzzle together with you. Um, and uh, let's see what that picture shows us. And the hard part sometimes, of course, is that uh, the end puzzle pieces, what's going to work, aren't in the puzzle yet. You have to get there mm -hmm. to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Good. And so here, here we're going to start with inappetence or anorexia, not yeah. anorexia nervosa, like a person that has some kind of psychological thing and they are starving yeah. themselves, but mm -hmm. anorexia not wanting to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and so how can you think of cases that you've treated where you thought it might be one thing, but because you're more invested in your hands on physical exam, mm -hmm. that things didn't add up or it switched yeah. you a different way. Absolutely. Um, I can um, absolutely think of cases. Oh, I remember a kitty cat um, uh, that we saw in as a referral. Um, it hadn't been eating for a few days and the pet parent kudos to the pet parent. The pet parent was like, what we're doing is not working. Mm, uh, their previous vet was not willing to change the differential diagnosis. Um, and so uh, they came in and, and said, my pet's not eating. What are we going to do? Um, and I, I, I get it. Um, the, the first veterinarian, um, some of us, some of us find cats hard to read. And so the initial veterinarian was saying, Hey, um, the cat's dental disease is what's causing it not to eat very well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the simplest and best test I did was I put a snack in front of that cat and saw what it did with it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that cat, um, someone with dental disease would still sniff it and be interested and maybe try snacking on it. And what this cat did was backed away furiously and started mm -hmm. lip smacking. Wow. Um, that cat is nauseous. Yeah. Um, 
And that's great because then it tells me, hey, sure, you have dental disease. Absolutely. At some point, we need to address that and approach it. Um, and instead, what we really need to do is focus on your nausea so that you start eating again. And we need to figure out why you're nauseous so we can help figure out what to do. Right, right. And so in my mind, I see you and it's so many things. Everything is so many things. But trying to communicate this to vet students, the first thing is you didn't assume that the other veterinarian, whether it was a specialist or who knows what, what that they were correct, you thought independently and analyzed this. So you always take your own history you always do your own exam. Right. Because uh, what, what, what was true one day might not be true literally 24 hours later. And so uh, nothing against that first veterinarian for that kitty cat. That veterinarian did nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and it may have been that at that moment, maybe that veterinarian did offer that cat a snack. I actually know that veterinarian did not, um, uh, though, um, hey, uh, maybe that veterinarian did. That's totally okay. It may just be that uh, what they saw one day is different. And that's part of the story, right? The story evolves whether you're um, participating in it or not. The story proceeds without you. Um, you're the, just there to be part of the, part of the story um, and figure it out. Right, right. And then, so the next thing I know, this is like a micro dissection of this event, um, is, is that one has to feel empowered enough and connected enough with just the, the event. Like you have to feel like you could be right. So I think that many vet students emerge from training, from vet school, mm -hmm. like I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. All every other vet knows more than me. I mean, I think that there's two, uh, just a, a very disempowering. You end up leaving vet school a little bit beat up. Yes, that's how it goes. Um, um, it's just how it goes. Um, and um, and so uh, knowing what you know and knowing uh, what you don't know, it's okay to say I don't know. Um, and move forward from there. Um, again, I, I do think of, um, of differential diagnosis as a story or a puzzle, and you're putting the puzzle pieces together or you're following the story down different paths, stuff like that. And if you get to a point where you're like, I don't know, either reach out and ask somebody for help, that's totally okay to do. Um, uh, even if you're in a, an area of the country where there's not a whole lot of other veterinarians, um, you, wherever you went to vet school, um, they have a commitment to you um, to help you for the rest of your career. Um, and they, you can reach back to them and say, I have questions. It's a free service for you. It's a free service for your clients. Um, use it. Um, and in doing that, you get to be um, the best veterinarian you can be. Uh, you get to help yourself learn more. Um, that's fun. Um, I love veterinary, veterinary medicine for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons I love it absolutely is because every day I learn something new. Um, that's really cool. How many of us have jobs where we can say, I learned something new today and you've been in that career or profession for decades. What a cool thing. Um, and uh, you get to help the pet the pet um, do better and thrive. Uh, and honestly, uh, your old professors, they want to know that you're doing okay. They want to know that, you, that they're helping you. So if you reach back to them and say, hey, I've got this question, or I think we talked about this, but I don't remember it. And I'm not going to look up my notes because that's going to take too much time. Uh, <laughs> right. What do you have to, they don't, they don't, they don't mind. Um, um, they're not going to tell you, you know, you should have learned that in class. Um, they're just going to help you. Um, so reach back and, and ask them. Right. Well, that's great. <laughs> you know, 20 something years later, I, that didn't even occur to me. <laughs> to yeah, um, but they're, well, they tell you that commitment and every vet school has that commitment um, to you. And if you're in a state that has a vet school, like uh, say you went to University of Glasgow and you're not going to call Scotland because now you're in California and it just won't work out time zone wise, yeah. whatever state you're in. And um, also that state vet school, if there is a state vet school, um, will also help you. Um, it's part of their um, their. Uh, their directive is that they're there to help all the people in the state, including um, local veterinarians. So even if you're not a graduate, if you have a vet school in your state, you can also reach out to them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> new. 
your wealth of information. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So, so anyway, so, so empowered to think independently for yourself, even if it goes against what somebody else thought, but then we have our hands to assess like the myofascial pieces is, is a big piece. Like how, what does their body tell you? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to move forward from there. So when we've talked about inappetence and dif- differential diagnoses as a whole, that there are various ways to approach that. And one that we've used with our medical acupuncture for veterinarians program with the case reports, as you know, is, is the acronym Vindicate the Myofascia. So Vindicate like vascular, inflammatory, neoplastic, degenerative, all that. Um, but, but there's also, and I was interested as I was researching for this talk to look at some studies that have been done. And in actuality, an anatomic approach can be more fruitful Mm -hmm. and so but i think that the perhaps a blending of them keeping keeping the different pathophysiologic processes of inflammation um, iatrogenic causes congenital things like that Mm -hmm. in there but Mm -hmm. when we think about inappetence like how would you have been taught to do a differential in school? Because I, uh, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but I don't really remember that being something that was drilled into us that much. Um, I I do remember being taught an acronym. I'm actually terrible at acronyms, so I can absolutely tell you that I absolutely forgot the acronym. Like <laughs> and that's why we don't I use forgot yeah, right. it. And that's why I don't use it. Um, <laughs> yeah, not that that's a bad way for those of us that are that that works for. It. Absolutely, that can be a good method. Um, and then um, typically, I do use um, a stem to stern um, kind of approach. So nose to tail, mm-hmm. um, whatever the species is, something like right. that. Right. Um, and uh, um, that that method can work very well. Um, I remember vividly in vet school, um, one of my mentors talking to me about uh, that uh, always leading me back to what's your differential diagnosis? Um, everything right. stems from there um, yeah. uh, and pulling me back to that over and over again. And absolutely when I'm uh, talking about a, when I'm working with a, um, an animal and I um, get stuck or we see a lot of referrals um, whenever I'm seeing a referral, um, we always start back at the beginning, start the story over again and, uh, and figure out what the story tells you. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's great. Yeah. Because that was a good mentor. Uh, maybe you were a better student than I was. Uh, but no, uh, <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> but what, um, what I see, um, though. I slept a lot in class. You did? Yeah. yeah. I was acupuncturing my co- co-students in the back of the room. I yeah, thought but, mm-hmm. I thought I was invisible. But then when I started yeah. teaching, you see everything. Right. Anyhow. So, us. okay. Well, let's do the stems to stern for sure. inappetence. And so, what, and, so, and Russell's Russell's a proud volunteer. Nice job, Russell. Yeah. Thanks for volunteering. Woof, woof. Yep. One time I <laughs> Thanks, Russell. Some, I ate some marijuana cookies. You can see the wrap on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't feel good. No, mm-hmm. no, no. <laughs> poor Russell. Any, poor Russell. Yeah. Your pupils are really big, Russell. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, and so so for a dog, and then we have we have Stacy here as well to talk about cat things. Stacy's amazing. I love Stacey her hair. Is, yeah, she's she's a good girl. Maybe um, Stacy's a boy. I didn't ask. Sorry, sorry, Stacy. Oh, no, no, she's a girl. A boy or girl. She's just shy. Okay, um, <laughs> I can see that. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so 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 yeah. I mean, so so we'll put we'll let Stacy rest for a while, but. Um, stem, to good st- that. <laughs> stem to stern if we said Russell wasn't eating well um, so we can talk about from nose down and yeah. also then to not forget what's what's in the general environment yeah so so what what are your first thoughts the dilated pupils and all what, how would you approach this, like, with the differentials? 
Yep. So I'd ask the pet parents a bunch of questions. Um, one of the big questions would be, hey, uh, when when they offer food to Russell at home, what does Russell do with it? Um, and uh, what many pet parents will say, he just walks away. And then asking more questions about that, um, starting that story. If um, it's very useful, um, uh, this tells you how old I am, because I'm going to say in our current day, um, <laughs> uh, it's very useful to sometimes ask the pet parents, send me a video, um, offer uh, Russell a snack and show me in a video um, what Russell does because then I can see a whole bunch of things. I can see where Russell's eating, um, the environment Russell's in. Um, is it something like, uh, hey, there's um, uh, that Russell's are, um, that Russell's more like Stacy, the shy kitty, um, and that the shy kitty is being fed um, in the middle of a living room where there's a TV going and five or six children playing, um, and there's a dog um, barking at uh, Stacy the cat. Um, um, the whole time, uh, that's that's about an environmental control. Um, uh, or uh, is it that uh, Russell has um, uh, can't reach his food either because Russell's neck hurts, um, and when Russell tries to bend down to reach, um, then it hurts. Or that Russell's um, uh, very, very weak in his hind legs, and his hind legs keep skidding out behind him every time he tries to eat from his bowl that's on the slippery kitchen floor. Um, and pretty quickly, Russell learns this hurts every time I eat, um, that it hurts his back end and his back, not as, so they, then he stops choosing to eat. Um, so starting with a good history um, is great. And then doing a thorough exam for me, for someone who's not eating, um, that thorough exam will begin again with offering that animal something to delicious and delightful um, yeah. and safe um, to eat um, in the exam room. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work out. Um, uh, it might be that, for instance, Stacy the cat says, I'm too nervous um, to eat at the vet's yeah. office. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I can see what Stacy does. Um, does Stacy does Stacy sniff it? Um, that tells me sh that Stacy can sniff, um, yeah. and that uh, yeah. the little adorable nerves um, that um, innervate Stacy's nose work correctly. Um, mm -hmm. Is it that Stacy, the adorable cat, has um, is sneezing the entire time she's trying to sniff the food? Is it that she can't smell because she's got a, a URI? Um, right. Um, uh, it, is it that Russell, the dog? Um, uh, uh, can't lick the food, that there's something neurologically different uh, with Russell's tongue. Um, and then that leads me to do, I should, hey, check out all of the um, facial nerves. Um, uh, is it that uh, Russell the dog can't um, prehend, can't swallow? Um, is it that Russell the dog um, uh, uh, can't see? Um, I recognize right. vision is not always a, a condition of eating, except it can be. Um, it lets me know about Russell's um, cognition. Um, mm -hmm. Is it that uh, that Russell the dog has cognitive dysfunction and doesn't recognize there's food there? Um, uh, and then it lets me also recognize, hey, is this part about a, partly about a physical body? Is it about neck pain, mouth pain, um, tooth right. pain, if Russell's drooling food out of one side of his mouth or the other, things like that. So, wow, who knew we could all um, get so much information about offering someone a snack? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, right. And so with each thing and, and the head being so multisensorial mm -hmm. that that even just looking and so then you don't have to worry about vindicator or vitamin a b d c right. whatever. so uh so so of course gustatory or, or just interest in food begins in the brain and right. so um even like with us you know there's the anticipation so if i say like pizza or chocolate sundae or whatever it's like already this that can get the salivary juices flowing right. and um I would think with animals, you know, hearing an, a can opening or whatever, mm -hmm. but, but maybe plastic bag rustling. A lot of dogs know what plastic bags are. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, so there's that. So, so considering like in the process in general for, for, for just how you want mm -hmm. approaches, like what's the normal physiology and what, what has gone wrong, but the head is a, is just everything. <laughs> I was like, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, but that's not where it ends. But, mm -hmm. um, 
but thinking about, okay, how visual are they? So, so it's still, you're doing a complete exam and you're, even if you think about the nose, okay, or, or is there an occlusion? Is there inflammation? Is there neoplasia? Is there a foreign body? Right. Um, and then we had talked earlier about what if somebody has coronavirus that's a non-human, does that affect their olfactory neurons? Right, right. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then what's with the brain? And then even uh, um, with the ears, uh, and the just the temporal region, the vestibular aspect, of course, some, you would know if you saw the patient, mostly if they were vestibular. Right, right. Um, but blindness, but I would think that besides the nose, but the, the mouth is just an incredible amount of... So like right there, that helped me a lot. Russell doesn't have any teeth. Um, so <laughs> Russell might have, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Russell. I think yeah. it's okay though, Russell, because that helps us know that maybe if we're offering you that crunchy dog cookie, Russell, that might be something you can't, can't eat. Maybe you're just right. trying to swallow it whole. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so, so mom would need to know the modifications to make. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And so there's the teeth, there's the salivary glands to wet right. the food, the yeah. tongue, as you mentioned, the neurologic control over it. There's the mucosa and mm -hmm. uh, is there ulcerations? And, and mm -hmm. then of course with cats, there's, I'm so phobic about a thread getting around the base of any of my- sure, sure. Doing a thorough oral pharyngeal exam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and, then, and then there's the craniofacial mechanics, the TMJ. Absolutely. Uh, and and so, so palpating, and that's where that whole myofascial palpation, really having a hands-on feeling, I mean, are they tender there, the TMJ, knowing where the TMJ is? Right. And, um, and then of course we, we look at facial nerves and, and trigeminal mm -hmm. nerves. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's the food itself that, that they're feeding at home. And there's so many food recalls anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> like just, and, and is there mm -hmm. aflatoxin? Is there, is there right. hypervitaminosis D? I mean, is there too much vitamin D in there? Right. Um, right. So, and asking the pet parents questions, you know, what are they offering at home? Is this something that Russell, Russell or Stacy normally eat? and um, talking to them about what is feeding time. Um, is it that they feed the animal once a day and the animal doesn't finish their meal and that's what the pet parents per perceiving as inappetence and really yeah. it's just the animal saying my stomach's full um, or not that they're not hungry later in the day but um, just that that could be something. Um, or is it uh, that they're offering canned food or raw food and they, um, life gets busy and they forget to clean the food bowl. Um, the food bowl itself becomes its own um, aversion because the food bowl smells nasty. Oh, um, yeah. uh, and that the food that's sitting in the food bowl um, is um, uh, not fit for consumption because it's yeah. been left out too long. Right. I um, mean, it's, asking it's, questions like that. Yeah. I mean, especially if they're feeding raw and there's sure. some kind of infectious thing and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, and then rancid, like if they have whatever with, with whatever food, but especially if they have a high omega-3 or something in, right. in the diet, like that only has a certain amount of shelf life. Like how long do you recommend typically that people allow feeding from an open bag of dry food even? Depends on the brand because uh, some mm -hmm. of the brands have te technology to keep the foods um keep the food well. If you ask veterinary nutritionists, not me, um, they'll say if the, if the pet food bag, um, says, Hey, it's designed to keep the pet food fresh, um, then keep the food in that pet food container. Don't dump it in a secondary container, um, to try to avoid oxidation. Um, right. some, some of the pet food bags supposedly do that. Um, yeah. uh, and then if I have a choice, I'll encourage pet parents buy in small quantities. Um, and, um, I recognize that is sometimes a waste of like plastic and packaging and increased cost, and it can save you veterinary bills in the long run um, yeah. because you're not feeding food that's gone bad. Good point. Yeah. So to see if if they will eat anything, uh, and then that gets us kind of into the acute or chronic anorexia mm -hmm. or inappetence. So right. mm -hmm. so maybe there's um, an acute. So that's where I think of the reflexive administration of an appetite stimulant after surgery, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if we thought about the post-operative ileus or mm -hmm. something with the pain medications, the drugs that are making that animal not feel well, mm -hmm. why, why not perform some acupuncture, some neuromodulation for 
um, enhancing GI transit and sure. reducing pain mm -hmm. that is going to make that animal just feel better and clear out the drugs better, mm -hmm. just the post-operative stuff and get and be interested. And then plus de-stress them because I know like working at, 20, at CSU for 20 years, I mean, just comforting the animal, the cat, that was in the ICU, maybe had had procedures, just isn't eating. And just to go there, I mean, especially little Stacy, and just, just even bring them outside of the critical care unit and have them in a cat friendly area and, um, and just, just start massaging them and, mm -hmm. and just doing everything that comforts the kitty mm -hmm. and then having the food. And then it's like, okay, I'll eat some now, but they're so frozen with fear. Mm -hmm. And that, that wouldn't happen at your, practice but I, I know with a lot of places that I mean they're just freaked out and so so getting them and cuddling them and, and then the massage too even if it's not acupuncture massage will help normalize GI stuff absolutely yeah, yeah. so um, absolutely GI distress um, can be a reason for not eating well whether it's that um, they're nauseous or they have acid reflux um, or that they have esophagitis esophagitis is I've never had it, fortunately, but it's supposed to be crazy painful. Mm. Um, so painful that you don't want to swallow anything. Um, or um, uh, is it that you have megacolon in your um, poor Stacy's, you know, stuck full of um, poop and needs to get rid of it so that she can then say, look, I've got room in my GI tract and my hunger centers now turn on again. Um, I, totally. Uh, yeah. Right, right. And um, yeah, I mean, I, and I love, <laughs> treating cats with constipation because it can be so effective but of course yeah. sometimes you have to just do the animal do whatever it is to get rid of the stool that's there mm -hmm. and then and start normalizing them and then what i would do is educate the client on um on areas to massage and then yeah. diet changes yeah. make sure they have ad adequate access to water and and hydrated Absolutely. food yeah. um so yeah, so we're moving down. So we've we've discussed kind of head things and any uh, spinal pain, neck pain, back pain, mm -hmm. surgeries, um, abdominal things, esophagitis, gastritis. What about um, like internal organ problems that you've seen? Cases mm -hmm. that you could think of with liver, kidney, metabolic disease, and how how have you mm -hmm. helped them? Typically. Yeah. Um, so um, again, going back to that story and figuring out, hey, is this a uh, story about um, someone who has um, Stacy the cat has kidney disease and her um, her um, because she has kidney disease, she's inappetent, um, her phosphorus levels are high, stuff like that. Um, uh, or is it that uh, Stacy has kidney disease and she's anemic? and she's exhausted. And so the effort of eating um, yes. is, um, is exhausting. Um, mm -hmm. Those two things, sure, absolutely, I'm gonna treat that cat's kidney disease. And if I'm using acupuncture as a piece of that, absolutely, I'm gonna help that cat's kidneys and I'm gonna try to help those other things based on what the underlying pathology is. Um, uh, liver disease, for sure, um, can cause uh, inappetence. Um, all the way from nausea to diarrhea to simply just saying, I, I don't feel good enough to eat. Um, and then, um, uh, of course, Addisonians um, might not eat well. Um, they might either be picky about eating or not eat. Um, yeah. And then uh, Cushingoid animals, we're all experienced with Cushingoid what many of us are experienced with Cushingoid animals um, that will eat anything in their paths, which then means um, thinking again about, hey, did they eat a foreign object that should not be consumed um, by most of us? Um, and then there are a few Cushingoid animals that don't feel well um, and uh, they um, are panting so much, they have aerophasia. Um, and because yeah. they do, um, they're gassy and bloated and don't want to eat. Um, and so, uh, again, going back to what's the story, not just the diagnosis, but what's the story and then piecing through, Hey, how would I help this animal friend? Um, for sure. If there was someone that had aerophasia, sure. I might toss in a few needles to try to help with their Cushing's. Um, uh, it's classic and it can be classic in animals like that have Cushing's disease that they might have, um, uh, um, partial ileus or that they, uh, that their GI tract speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Whoa. Um, that's abdominal cramping right there. Um, wow. and if they have aerophasia, 
um, helping with that. Um, are there some acupuncture needles I can put in to help so that their chest muscles aren't quite so tight um, mm -hmm. and crampy, make them feel better? Um, uh, and um, coming up with what's the whole story. Right, right. That's great. So, so the more you know good solid medicine, the more you you have those stories and you can put hypotheses together. And the areas that you talked about um, aerophasia, but but also then we have yeah. cardiopulmonary disease. Absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, do they have congestive heart failure? Are they doing so much work to breathe? Um, right, that it's uncomfortable. There's uh, the, um, uh, my understanding when I chat with a cardiologist is if your respiratory rate's above 40, you can't eat. Um, um, and that uh, you're so invested in going, <laughs> oh wow, you can't eat very well. Um, uh, so knowing that uh, that could be a reason for you to not be eating well, um, and should we be addressing um, your respiratory rate um, to help you with that so that you can eat? Yeah. Right, right. Or if you have um, some kind of pleural buildup of fluid or... or Yeah. Um, or you have heart enlargement and because right. your heart um, is enlarged, it's pushing, pushing your esophagus out of place um, and therefore you have acid reflux or you have positional acid reflux um, and that, hey, because uh, your heart's um, uh, pushing up on your esophagus. Usually I should use an x-ray to demonstrate this, but hopefully... You guys can all imagine that, but um, mm -hmm. then uh, if your heart's enlarged and it's pushing up in your esophagus, if you then drop your head, it becomes quite uncomfortable um, oh, to, yeah. right. to eat. Um, uh, right. So it's not just about respiratory rates. It's about, hey, all those other pieces of heart disease. Right, right. That's great. And so, so with musculoskeletal pain, uh, have you had cases where treating the pain improves the appetite? Absolutely. Pain in, in and of itself um, is a deterrent to eating. Um, I think of any of us as, as humans, because well, because probably most of us that are listening to this podcast are human, um, have had that nasty, nasty headache where you're just oh, saying, yeah. "Ugh, my head hurts so much. I don't want to eat. That's just a headache. Um, yeah. Never mind uh, if you have a migraine. Never mind if you have um, intractable um, pain elsewhere in your body help that pain so that that way you can feel good enough to say I can sustain myself I can eat right right and then um maybe what about what about medications have you seen certain medications really disrupt an animal's interest in eating absolutely um uh it's a uh I think of it when I talk to pet parents, um, any medication or supplement has on the packaging um, may cause nausea, may cause uh, vomiting, may cause inappetence, may cause diarrhea. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the simple ones I can think of is, hey, we've all met somebody that um, something is, um, as uh, simple as vitamin C um, causes uh, their stomachs to not feel well. I right. think that person you know that says, oh, we can't drink orange juice because uh -oh, um, then their GI tract gets super upset or they're nauseous or they can't feel like they can't eat. Um, uh, to a lot of us, vitamin C seems innocuous and it might not be. Um, right. So for any of us, um, it can be that anything we're taking by mouth um, could cause uh, you to not feel well and therefore not want to eat. Right, right. I mean, I know, at least in, uh, in my bolder human days, that, that there would be people that would prescribe high doses of vitamin C. Like until you start bleeding per rectum, you should take as much as you can. Oh. I mean, mm -hmm. so it, it is a GI irritant. Mm -hmm. um, and then other things that I've seen, even Chinese herbs or any kind That's of it. herb, but especially with, with kitty cats, boy, <laughs> whether it's the frequent administration of an herb or, or something, but that can really throw them off. Kitties are sensitive people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, Stacy? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, yes. Um, uh, yeah, so anything you're taking um, by mouth, um, Oh, I, I remember fondly a pet parent, lovely pet parent, um, dedicated pet parent, uh, fabulous. Um, they um, kept bringing their wonderful golden retriever in saying, hey, he's not eating again. And um, uh, we talked through different scenarios and uh, turned out that dog was eating bark mulch. 
a lot. Um, oh. It's a golden retriever. They eat bark mulch yeah. if it's an option. And we talked, and we talked about that's probably the the underlying source of repeated um, inappetence. And the pet parent was like, "But he eats bark mulch all the time, and he's only inappetent sometimes." Um, the the story then um, and the path we took was, "Hey, let's get him to stop eating bark mulch for X amount of time, whatever the interval was that we thought. Hey, look, um, he has bouts of inappetence between this time and this time, and see if we can skip the next bout." And then, of course, in a pure scientific method, um, uh, then let him go do what he wants to do and see mm-hmm. if it reoccurs. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we were acupuncturing that dog actively. Um, he did have IBD. Um, uh, and um, uh, so we were able to keep close contact with that pet parent and find out, hey, the bark mulch, um, removing the bark mulch from the dog's, dog's um, uh, culinary um, uh, um, opportunities um, did help a ton to keep him healthier and happier and out of the vet's office. Yeah. So, so preventing him from eating the bark yeah. mulch. Yeah. That, I mean, see, and that that even is interesting. Like, there's again, there's still always so many paths to go down. Like, what was attracted to bark mulch? Was there a need for more fiber in the diet, uh, especially so with IBD? For, for that particular dog, we did pursue that path actively. Um, that dog was a dog who uh, needed to lose weight. So he was on a diet. So he was hungry all the time. Um, so as um, once yeah. we figured that out, um, we were like, hey, we can come up with other answers here. Um, here's other ways we can make sure that the dog feels satisfied. Um, and that did help absolutely with um, his consumption of bark mulch. Um, yeah. Wow. I mean, see, and and... Again, it comes full circle, like you spend uh, around 40 minutes with each patient and and are in very close communication with their mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. And you can find this. You can't do this in five minutes or 10. I mean, and you're you're committed. I- you know, I, can, I could appreciate um, that you could have pet parents every time they visit you fill out um, uh, some kind of format either online or in paper before you sat down and chatted with them, it would help you lead the discussion a little faster if you needed to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, fairly regularly. We ask pet parents to um, email us ahead, um, whatever their questions, concerns, thoughts, um, insights are ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And that does help direct a conversation. That's cool. And then just to follow the other thing with the bark mulch is, I mean, there's plenty of, phytoactive mm-hmm. constituents in, in bark mm-hmm. and what type of bark was it and, yeah. and, and was it treated but yeah you know, what what herbal aspects were there I, I mean just in and in, into the zoopharmacognosy kind of thing where animals intrinsically especially in the wild they they will seek medicinal plants even if it has to take them a long time to get there and they will use them in certain ways so just yeah. so fascinating. Yeah. And for that dog, honestly, we made sure to say, look, um, make sure that the bark mulch your dog's eating is not based out of chocolate fibers because there is a, um, or rubber, um, right? Because um, there are mulches that are mixed with those things. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, and then coloring agents because you can- Coloring make- agents. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, I'm trying to think if there's, Anything else that we need to consider? I think we've been through a lot of it, but I mean, certainly there's always things like, you know, whether it's psychosocial, you know, the quality. Oh, I'll tell you another. The last thing I want to contribute is um, adding stuff to their water. This just bothers yeah. me because mm-hmm. there's, there are products that you can put in the drinking water right. that will clean the teeth. And to me, it's, it's like putting a little bit of bleach in or something. I just can't imagine doing that. I would want the, the purest water for my animal. Some animals will consume that and drink it. And so it does um, help their teeth. And um, I have found quite a few animals that won't drink that because yeah. um, uh, I'm sure it has a, a taste and an odor, um, some kind of um, a sensation on their tongue. Um, you know, is it that it tastes more metallic or something like that, which yeah. might not really be about the, the taste of it so much as it might be how it interfaces with the taste buds on your tongue. 
kind of thing. Um, right. and, and absolutely, I do not want anyone not to drink. Um, uh, I, yeah, that's very important. So. Right, right. Well, and and what does it do to their to their um, stomach? Like once it gets there, sure. if it's designed to clean plaque and and their sure. biome or something. But sure, um, what's it do to the biome, and what does it do to the pH of the body? All those wonderful things. Right, 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 right. So yeah, so I think that's that's a very comprehensive at least start. Just that's that's what I want to do is give people some thoughts. I mean, just even sitting here talking to you because I'm not in general practice, but how amazing that you have all these recommendations at your fingertips and, and it's a pathway into to so many aspects of that animal's health, their, their living situation, you know, their food, their, how are they going to thrive and survive and all that stuff if they're not eating? Well, so anyway, again, still, still very impressed with who you are and what you do. Thanks. And yeah. Yeah. And um, honestly, for those of us in practice that think oh, this is too much time um, to invest, um, use the resources that are available to you. Ask people to send you videos ahead. Ask people to email you their thoughts mm-hmm. and questions because it might direct your conversation so you can utilize time um, to your utmost. And then right. reach out for your resources. Reach out um, to, uh, sure, you can, you know, you can VIN things, you can Google things. Um, you can empower your nursing team to help you explore some of those things. Um, you can uh, reach out to your local um, specialists. They are they actually part of the the um, the oath they take as specialists is to make sure that they do um, uh, outreach to the rest of the veterinary community. And so you're actually helping them do that outreach so that they can count it as part of their oh. community outreach. You know, um, they're required yeah. to do X number of ours as, as community outreach and CE. So if they want to document every conversation they have with you or say, hey, you're they're in regular touch with you for cases, you're actually helping them. Um, right. And you can build strong bonds then um, right. with them so that they can uh, continue to be um, an aid to you and to your practice and help you do best medicine for everybody. Yeah, yeah. There, I just learned another thing. I just didn't know that. And, and I know that um, in our other discussions, you've talked about being an introvert, but that I think I'm more of an introvert because I, it just doesn't come that this didn't occur to me. I would. We all kind of think, I, I think we're taught in veterinary medicine and vet school um, that, Hey, we should be able to all figure this out on our own. That's what I hear a lot from people yeah. who join our right. practice and from vet students. Mm-hmm. And it's not about you. Right. right. It's, it's about trying to help that animal. Um, right. And so, um, so knowing that um, all of those resources are there to help you. They wouldn't be there if they weren't trying to help you. Um, So uh, utilizing them, um, it helps you become a better doctor. Um, It helps you help your patient. Um, It helps you use your time and your um, team's time to its most effective um, thing to utilize all those resources. Yeah, that's really great. And I I would think it, it, they, they like to, like you said, follow up with their students or people in the community. It's just, Mm-hmm. This is a helping profession and, and we it's a get, profession. Yeah, yeah, we We're get all through. here because we care. Yeah, yeah. And it is reinforcing to help others. I mean, yeah, absolutely. They're appreciative. Wow, yeah. great. Well, thank you. I, I think um that's been very instructive and yeah. I look forward to our future conversations. Yeah. Um thanks for making the time today. Yeah, you too. Okay, we'll we'll be in touch. Take thank care. You. Bye. Take care. If you'd like to learn science-based integrative medicine and rehabilitation, join us at CuraCore Vet.